Now, as I was saying to you in our last study, uh, while we see Jesus on trial here, in a sense there are actually seven trials where he's arrested late at night, we saw that, and he was taken first of all to Annas, the father-in-law of the high priest. He interrogated him. He passed him on to Caiaphas, who was the high priest. That was late at night. Very early the next morning, the Jewish council met. They were called the Sanhedrin, and they again put him on trial. Then they took him to Pilate. Pilate wasn't quite sure what to do, but he discovered that Jesus came from Galilee, so he sent him to Her to Herod, and Herod tried him as well. Herod didn't know what to do, so he sent him back to Pilate, and Pilate still was dithering, so finally Pilate washed his hands, and he handed him over to the people, in a sense that they would make, take the final verdict. Uh, the whole thing was an absolute sham. By the way, the bit we're seeing in the passage we're reading today is that bit where Jesus is taken to Pilate. Luke shortens very much uh, the, what, the, the, the trial before Pilate at that point. You can read a lot more over in John's Gospel and we'll refer back and forth a little bit to that this morning. Uh, but then Pilate passes him on to Herod and at the very end of the passage we see him coming back again uh, to Pilate. But the whole thing was a complete sham. And actually, the verdict, Jesus knew the verdict from before time began. In fact, it wasn't really Jesus at all who was on trial here. It is everybody else who was on trial. Uh, these people are making decisions as if they are in control. But actually, it is Jesus Christ who is in control. It is God who is in the throne. Peter in preaching in Acts chapter 2 and verse 23 says, This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him on the cross. And so these people are responsible, they're guilty, they're culpable, but they're not in control. And let me say, when you fail to come to Jesus Christ, don't ever imagine that you're in any sense in control. You cannot, or I cannot, or no one cannot imprison the Lord Jesus Christ. But this I'll say to you right at the very outset. He can set you free. Jesus says to us, all your sinners, if the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. And the great old hymn says, He breaks the power of cancelled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. And so actually it's not really Jesus that's on trial at all. Here. It's everyone else. And what I want you to see this morning is the various attitudes in the courtroom. They're very solemn. The first one is antagonism. Sheer opposition and anger and malice, determination. We've seen already the hurry that these Jewish leaders were in to get Jesus sentenced in chapter 22 and verse 66. At daybreak, they call the council. Now in verse 1 of our passage today, then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. These are the busiest people in Jerusalem. Determination is driving them. They're in a hurry. But also we're seeing huge hypocrisy. These Jewish leaders drove a cart and horses through everything that they believed in order to get Jesus executed. They hated Roman rule. And yet here they are rushing to the Roman governor for help. What hypocrisy. They absolutely detested paying taxes to Caesar. And yet here they bring Jesus on a charge that he told them not to pay taxes to Caesar. What hypocrisy. And in the midst of the most sinful act ever committed on the face of the earth, these leaders stayed outside Pilate's palace. You can read it in John chapter 18 and verse 28 because they wanted to remain clean in God's eyes in order that they might eat the Passover feast. What total hypocrisy as they handed over the Savior. There was a hurry, there was hypocrisy, and there was just downright hatred. Look at verse 2. They began to accuse him. 
Verse 5, they insisted he stirs up the people. Verse 10, the chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Look at verse 18, with one voice they cried out, away with this man. Verse 21, they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Verse 23, with loud shouts they insistently demanded that he be crucified. Sheer hatred. Why? It's because of the satanic battle, because of this unseen battle that is going on. Believers in Christ, we encounter this battle every day. We see it at every corner. In our world, there are people who illogically hate Jesus. They hate the gospel message. They hate the church of Christ. Maybe even some of you who are Christians can remember a time when you were antagonistic to the gospel. Certainly the Apostle Paul could remember that. And many of us can remember a time when we were antagonistic to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Perhaps you're antagonistic today. Perhaps today you're sitting there and you hate the gospel. You hate to hear that you must be born again. These people stood in the presence of the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus, the lovely Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was compassionate and loving, and they were angry. People heard the good news. People hear the good news today, and they get angry. Is that you? There was antagonism. Secondly, there was amusement. Pilate, who was the Roman governor of Judea, sees the opportunity to pass Jesus across to Herod, the Tetrarch of Galilee. Herod was in Jerusalem also on a sort of a PR exercise, pretending that he was interested in the Passover. His palace was just 300 yards from Pilate's hall, so Pilate sends him across there. And Herod treats the whole thing as a huge joke. Look at verse 8. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he'd been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. Herod treats Jesus as a clown, a magician, an entertainer. Herod is having a laugh. And oh, you know there are many people today and they're having a laugh at the gospel. They're having a laugh at Jesus Christ. They treat the things of eternity in a light and loose and humorous way. And whether people do that publicly or privately, it is a desperately solemn thing. Herod was having a childish laugh, but let me tell you this. Herod was covering a dark secret. Herod had ordered the execution, the beheading of John the Baptist. Herod's father had tried to execute the baby Jesus and had killed lots of babies in the process. And we know from elsewhere in the scripture that Herod's conscience at a time was bothering him. I always tremble when people laugh at spiritual things when they treat the name of Jesus lightly, when they laugh at the gospel message, when they treat eternal things with levity and amusement, because ultimately it is a cover for the deep problem inside. Ultimately it is escapism from truth that lies deep inside. It's very solemn when people descend to this level. And so look what happened with Herod here. Verse 9, he plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. Jesus answered the poorest beggar who cried to him for help. Jesus spent time with the lowest of the low, the Dinanites. Jesus conversed with the humblest people. But this man, Herod, had by his mockery, cut himself off from the Savior of the world. As a mocker, all he got from Jesus 
was silence. Verse 9, he plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. What a solemn pointer that is to out ahead for those who don't trust the Savior, for those who laugh about the gospel. And one day, we'll never hear the voice of Jesus again. Never even hear the name of Jesus again. It will be a terrible, solemn silence. Was Herod convicted here? No, he laughed all the more. Look at verse 11. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked Jesus. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent them back to Pilate. Herod stood in the presence of the eternal Son of God, the judge of all mankind, and all he could find was amusement. Oh, let me ask you today, are you laughing at spiritual things? Are you treating these things lightly? Beware, because that's desperately solemn. You ought to be very afraid today. But believers in Christ, we're experiencing this all around us all the time, that people are laughing at spiritual things, just hang in there. There was arrogance, there was amusement. The third reaction and attitude that I see here on this occasion was just arrogance. Verse 2, they began to accuse Jesus. We tremble for these people as they bring the Lord Jesus Christ before a court and accuse him of a crime as they set themselves up in judgment over the Son of God. You know what's happening here? Sinners are condemning the sinless one. And you say, how dare they? This is like a prisoner in a court of law taking to the judge's bench and putting the judge down into the dock. Only this is far more seriously because an earthly judge is still imperfect. But this is the perfect, sinless Son of God. Man, Man who is frail and weak, a passing and helpless and dying sinner, puts the eternal, son, sinless God who created him on trial. And you say, if only they knew. But surely they did, did deep down. Do you remember the woman at the well in John chapter 4 who began to interrogate Jesus? And Jesus said to her, if you knew who it is you're talking to, you would have asked him and he'd have given you living water. And we say, if only they had known. But here's the monumental difference with that woman at the well. She began to recognize who Jesus was. And she began to say to the people in her village, could this be the Christ? And that day, that woman drank at the living fountain. That day, she received the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. That day, she was born again. That day, she was changed never to be the same again. She's in glory now. Ask her when you see her and make sure you get to meet her. You must get to meet her. You must come to Christ if you have not already. What if you don't come to Christ? What if you turn your back on Christ? Be 100% sure of this. One day the tables will be turned. One day soon you will stand before the judgment bar. One day soon you who are outside of Christ will be declared guilty before a holy God. One day you will be sent down to begin your eternal sentence. Oh, Fred, you must come down off your high horse if you think you don't need Christ today. If you almost feel you can stand in judgment over him, you must come to Christ. You must drink at this living fountain. And oh, believers in Christ, just hang in there because that great day is coming when the books will be opened and when the Lamb's book of life will be opened. What a day. We see here the, the attitude of antagonism, the attitude of amusement, the attitude of arrogance. And the final one I want you to spot here this morning is the attitude of avoidance. Pilate was the Roman governor of Judea from AD 26 to AD 36. History books tell us that he was tactless. 
and that he ran himself into trouble on a number of occasions and had to backtrack. He lacked authority. He lacked direction. Even when the Jews came to his judgment hall and they said we can't go in because we want to keep ourselves clean he stepped out and dealt with it out on the steps and his approach to Jesus Christ was that he wanted to avoid having to deal with him and so you see first of all he tried to pass him back to the Jews John chapter 18 and verse 31 the first thing Pilate says is you take him and try him yourself the next thing, and you see it in our passage here, he sent him to Herod, hoping that that would get rid of Jesus. The next thing, he evades the one direct question that Jesus asks him in John 18 and 31, John 18 and 34. And though Pilate, having questioned Jesus, pronounces an innocent verdict, yet still he seeks to evade and he offers Barabbas or Jesus. And ultimately, of course, he washes his hands very publicly, even does it physically so that people might see that he's avoiding this all. And as we finish this morning, folks, maybe you sitting out there, maybe Pilate is the one here that you're like most of all. Because you say, I'm not antagonistic to the gospel and to Jesus Christ. And I don't mock the gospel in an amusing way and treat it lightly. And I don't arrogantly consider myself not to need Jesus Christ. Just quietly, I avoid the question. I refuse to consider it. I fail to face up to the great questions of sin and judgment and death and eternity. I just never have got around to dealing with the matters of the soul. Do you know what that means if you're in that position? It means that ultimately you wash your hands of Jesus. Pilate stood in the presence of the one who was always inviting people to come to him and Pilate avoided the question he spurned the invitation he turned away from Jesus the saviour who's always calling oh believer in Christ be so thankful today that he called you out of your deadness and darkness and that you're his today but if you still don't know Christ as your saviour He's calling today. And so, where are we today, folks? What is our attitude this morning to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the gospel of salvation, to the things of eternity? When we hear the gospel preached, when people approach us about our need to be saved, do we become antagonistic? Do we grow angry? Or do we just laugh the whole thing off? Is it just amusement that we think all of this is just silly nonsense? We just laugh it off. Or are we arrogant? Are we saying, I don't need this? Almost as if <laughs> Jesus Christ was on trial and the Bible was on trial and we are the ones making a verdict on it. Are we arrogant? Oh, how solemn it is to be any of those things today. But maybe it's just that you're avoiding. You're avoiding the big questions. You're avoiding the decision. Just like Pilate, you're washing your hands of it all. There's a great day coming, folks. A very solemn day. Oh, it'll be a marvellous day for those of us who belong to Jesus Christ. And when we get to that judgment throne and discover that he has done all that we need. Oh, what a day that will be. But it'll be a very solemn day, that day of judgment, if you don't yet know Christ as your Saviour. Oh, come to him today, if you have not yet come, for the Saviour is calling. Come to the Saviour. Make no delay. Here in his word, he has shown you the way. Here in our midst, he's standing today. 
tenderly saying, Come, oh, what a Saviour. Make sure we're ready for that great day when we go finally on trial. Let's pray. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all that you've done, that we may be safe on the great judgment day. And, Lord, we recognize this morning that it's not our Saviour who's on trial at all, but it's all of us standing before the throne of a holy God. Oh, Lord, we thank you for this way provided that we may be safe, that we may go free. Oh, our Father, we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to play you uh, this piece, Man of Sorrows. Man of Sorrows, of course, being the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining with us this morning. 